From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Lazarus hackers abuse Dell, former Uber security chief found guilty of data breach, and will Twitter finally become Twisla or TwitX? These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have been bringing to you on this week's Cybersecurity Headlines, and now we get a chance for some insight opinion and expertise on these stories and more from our guest, Pat Benoit, Global VP, GRC and Bizzo at CBRE. Pat, welcome to the show and thanks for your time. Thanks, Sean. Looking forward to it. Our sponsor for today's show is Hunters. Help your SOC mitigate real threats faster and more reliably than SIM. Join us on YouTube Live. Go to CISOseries.com. Hit the events drop down and look for the cybersecurity headlines we can review image. It's the third one down. Just click on it to join us. But we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got 20 minutes, so we're going to dive right into the first story. All right. Lazarus hackers abuse Dell driver bug using new FUD module rootkit. The, notor- the notorious North Korean hacking group Lazarus has been observed installing a Windows rootkit that abuses a Dell hardware driver in a bring your own vulnerable driver attack. The spear phishing campaign unfolded in the autumn of 2021, and the confirmed targets, an aerospace expert in the Netherlands and a political journalist in Belgium, were emailed fake job offers at Amazon. Among the tools deployed on this campaign is a new FUD module rootkit that abuses BYOVD technique to exploit a vulnerability in a Dell hardware driver for the first time. So Pat, a few different spins on this story. Um, Your thoughts on the severity of the attack? Um, the BYOVD concept or the fact that spear phishing, again, seems to be at the heart of this story. Well, it seems spear phishing or phishing in general is always at the heart of the story. And it, it's, it's a little surprising still with so much awareness that we're still caught off guard so many times. But what was interesting to me is I'd be curious to know uh, how they got the admin level access they needed to do a, you know, a BYOVD type attack. So, you know, what kind of what kind of layers and defense didn't exist to to be able to prevent that admin escalation that went on that that that's where I'd be worried. Yeah, that's that that is interesting. And 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 Amazon seems to be more and more part of these social engineering uh, attacks as well. Um, any any thoughts on the human element? Is there anything that works? They seem to be coming, you know, be becoming more prevalent as well. The social engineering part seems very tough to, to tackle. Yeah, social engineering is just getting better. And they're getting they're getting smarter and smarter and, and we're getting in some ways more gullible and more gullible. I mean, one of the recent uh, social engineers that I saw was uh, going after cybersecurity professionals and offering them great jobs and then going through the interview process and letting it expose all their wonderful secrets in interviews and then uh, you know, take that information to run. What what a great social engineering approach. And uh, and yet we as cyber people fell for it. So yeah. I mean, how, how concerned do you think we should be? I, I know you talked about how did they get the, the access to, to, you know, perpetrate this vuln well, anyways, and to, I guess, load the driver up, the vulnerable driver. How big of a concern do you think BYOVD, bring your own vulnerable driver, uh, should, we, some, should we be concerned about that in and of itself? Or is it really the attack that happened before that, that allowed them to do it? Yeah, I think it's the 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 root attack that's the the big problem there because it, whether it's a you know BYOVD or it's a ransomware or it's some other uh, type of attack, some other exploit, um, you know they had to get into the into the network first. They had to get you know uh, access and escalate privilege and and be able to laterally move and all those kinds of things that you have to do to actually make it an effective attack and. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the fact that it's this type of an attack is way downstream, in my opinion. Well, if nothing more, we have a new acronym to remember. And, you know, we love that in this industry. <laughs> we don't have enough of them. No. <laughs> uh, moving on. All right. Former Uber security chief found guilty of data breach cover up. You may remember the story from 2016. U.S. federal court jury has found former Uber chief security officer Joseph Sullivan guilty of not disclosing a 2016 breach of customer and driver records to regulators in attempting to cover up the incident. The 2016 hack of Uber occurred as a result of two hackers gaining unauthorized access to the company's database backups, prompting Uber to secretly pay $100,000 in ransom in December of 2016 in exchange for deleting the stolen information. So here we go. High profile uh, company. 
uh, with the breach. And what's your take on the story? And especially, obviously, the the, the head of security sort of taking the fall uh, for for this one. Well, I, I've been fascinated watching some of the the commentary threads, conversation threads online, in that there seems to be this overwhelming. Uh, jump to, oh, it's a cultural problem. And that's great, except for the fact that we are failing to realize that culture is made up of individuals. And so in my opinion, I have to go back to, you know, where was the personal ethical uh, uh, behavior and standards for the individuals that made up that culture? And then, and then of course, the, the CISO that made that decision to play along in that kind of a culture. So I, I think I think this really goes back to personal ethical behavior and, because it wasn't just somebody got breached. It was then he tried to cover it up or was participant in covering it up and, uh, and, and, and then knew a federal crime was being committed according to the charges and decided that he was still going to keep that to himself. So should others be charged? Absolutely, in my opinion. I don't think he's the lone wolf here, but if it's a culture, then there's a whole bunch of individuals with ethical problems. Yeah, and there seems to be a blurred line, right, between personal accountability and corporate responsibility here um, that is interesting. And Uber has, uh, it's been no secret that they've had their share of scandals uh, over the years. In fact, uh, something was recently published, our, our producer brought to, to light, there's been the top 49 scandals uh, perpetrated by Uber. So take take from that what you will. But um, any any thoughts on on Uber itself, or like you said, that maybe the scapegoat, uh, scapegoat aspect of this too, um, whether it's Uber or not Uber, um, I think that's a concern for for CISOs and, and heads of security. Yeah, and maybe not so much in the financial realm, but is is Uber our generation's Enron? Uh, you know, they're willing to do things to make money that seem to be uh, you know inappropriate, um, and it, it's come up time and time and time again. Um, I don't know how you correct that if you, you know, other than to uh, have the investigators, you know, find reason that and, and evidence that there's something going on and charge them accordingly, appropriately. Um, as far as blaming the CISO, uh, you know, I think it's wrong that he's the only one. Uh, but, um, you, you know, by the same token, he was involved. So. Yep. And thanks to David Cross, who said the recent CISO case is very complex and not simple, a exactly. uh, simple blame case. So we just like to make it sound simple, David, but I totally agree. Um, there's always a little bit more nuance, especially in a story like this. All right, let's move well, on. Well, there's a great deal of nuance when you're not the person that's in the middle of it, too. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a little easier to discuss. That's for, that's yeah. for sure. Good, good point. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so let's move on to another uh, high profile story, a Twitter deal isn't done yet throughout this week the world has been a buzz while the while the will he won't he saga of elon musk's arrangements to finally buy twitter the delaware court of chancery approved twitter to proceed with a limited investigation into whether whistleblower peter mudge zatko contacted elon musk's lawyers prior to his previous attempt to back out of buying twitter this involved a may 6th email sent from an anonymous an anonymous proton mail account claiming to be a former exec at twitter leading teams directly involving trust and safety content moderation and offered Musk information on Twitter through alternate channels. So definitely, if nothing more, uh, uh, a very interesting uh, story uh, seems to continue to unfold. What do you think about the back channel activity here and one of the most significant high profile, I guess, takeovers in, in history? Yeah, well, if they prove the back channel activity had any kind of a legal component, then obviously they have to go after it. And but it, it sounds to me more like uh, some of this is, you know, Elon seemingly being a master of uh, marketing and, and controlling and using the news cycle as he's evidenced over the years over and over again. So, I mean, I think that that this in some ways has some of that smell on it that 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 it's being played to to create uh, interest, interest in the story uh, from the get go. Um, and, and where Twitter ends up, that'll be the real the real curiosity is because uh, Elon is not above using, uh, uh, w you know, his resources uh, for, uh, you know, call it a, a, a bully pulpit or whatever you want to call it. And so I would not be surprised if he does get quit Twitter to see it become in some ways nuanced, uh, a nuanced ideological and political platform for for his ideas. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, an interesting is I was kind of looking at this. Um, the forty-four billion, I believe, is the uh, price that that was initially agreed that that Elon indicated he'd like to move forward with the uh, the uh, the buyout. But um, there was a twenty-one percent increase in shares, which I thought was interesting uh, when that letter was received. So there's you know there's money being traded as well here in the background as this kind of unfolds which i think is an interesting uh, sort of tertiary effect of, of all of what's going on yeah it's paper money too and so the end result uh you know may be that there's some some attempt to control what's happening in the background by controlling the news cycle um you know that's not unheard of and frankly there's in, unless they're uh, uh, giving out insider information, there's nothing illegal about being in the news. <laughs> yeah, it feels like a love hate relationship too, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the your security is terrible. You have bot accounts everywhere, and then being sued. And then I'm going to back away. And then Twitter saying, "Well, we're going to sue you for backing away." And now, oh, I want back in. <laughs> so, well, I can't tell if Twitter wants to be bought or not either. So that that's the hard decision. Or if Elon wants to buy them or not. So we've got right. you know two players, two parties that they that they seem to be a little bit uh, you know uh, uh, bipolar in in their decisions of what they want to do. I think that's a good good word. We'll we'll just get our popcorn and uh, and uh, and keep moving. Um, so in another uh, next story, another Australian telco hit with breach. While Optus continues to deal with the fallout from its breach back in September, Australia's largest telco, Telstra, has confirmed it suffered a data breach at, at a third-party organization, exposing employee data back to 2017. It estimates that 30,000 people were impacted with names and email addresses leaked. So... Uh, we're seeing telecom companies being targeted more and more, although this was through a third party. Um, you know, do you think that telcos should be held to a higher security can, uh, standard because of their connectivity and obviously increasing uh, dependencies on telcos uh, for other organizations as well? What's, what's your take on this one, Patrick? Well, I think until we can start holding companies in certain industries to a higher standard, we need to start establishing a standard of some sort. Um, you know, right now it's it's all uh, industry or best practice or good practice or however you want to frame it. And so, um, you know, maybe when we're talking about sensitive data, this would be a good opportunity for some consensus on standards for privacy of sensitive data. Um, you know, we've got 50 states, I think 37-ish or 39 of them all have varying degrees of privacy laws. And they're all just a little bit different. Some are the same, some are different. So, you know, maybe it's time, as much as I hate regulation for the federal government, to step, step up and establish a standard. Once you establish a standard, then maybe we can start talking about whether or not certain industries have a higher standard necessary as a result of, of what they're handling. And that's interesting. And speaking of standardization, I mean, what about the third party aspect, right? I mean, we talk over and over now about supply chain and third parties and, and becoming third and fourth parties to one another. And, you know, how do we get the assurance that the controls are in place that we need of our suppliers and vendors? Yeah, see, unfortunately, um, because because of the lack of relationship, direct relationship, contractual relationship beyond your third party, um, there, there, there's not any really good way to enforce that except through, you know, you must, you must, uh, cascade down the, the standards that you agree with us. Um, but that's a lot of reliance on hope and, and, and sometimes dreams. Um, uh, you know, maybe this idea of a standard of some sort that is a required business standard for security, uh, is something that could help out with that. I, I don't know. You know, again, I'm, I'm very reticent to want to get involved in, in setting, you know, regulatory standards. But there are so many uh, competing interests here right now. Um, and maybe that's the way to go. It, it's hard to think of other solutions that would really help push this you know, materially forward in a standard way. So that's, right. that's interesting. Let's uh, let's move on and, and, and spend a few moments with our sponsor, Hunters. Hunters is a SaaS platform purpose-built for security operations teams, providing unlimited data ingestion and normalization at a predictable cost. Hunters helps SOC teams mitigate real threats faster and more reliable, reliably than SIM. Learn more at hunters.ai. Okay, let's move on to our next story. 
So ex-NSA employee charged with violating espionage Act and selling U.S. cyber secrets. The former employee, Jara Sebastian Delkey, appeared in federal court Thursday on charges that he attempted to transmit classified national defense information to an FBI agent he believed was a Russian operative in exchange for $85,000. Delkey was only employed by the NSA for about three weeks before quitting on July 1st, but while he was there, had top secret clearance in his role as information systems security designer, according to the FBI. So, so, so Patrick, um, I think the glaring question is why did it only take three weeks um, for this person to apparently get top secret clearance and have access to this type of information? Yeah, and there's a few interesting points here in this. One is, um, I, I guess most people think that you don't start on the clearance process until you actually get the job. And that's not really the case. In most cases, you don't actually start in the job until the clearance is finished. And the clearance could take any any number of uh, weeks, months, or, or, or whatever it takes to get it done. So I'm, I'm, I feel fairly certain the clearance was in place. So then the question becomes, you know, how, how strong was their data loss prevention, their data protection program? It sounds like though, if, if, they, if they did a sting and caught him trying to sell it, then maybe they got a pretty good program in place and insider risk is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so I, I'm not sure it's as bad a story as it sounds because it was stopped before any data was lost. Yeah, that's an interesting spin on the DLP. Um, and then there's the question of, do you think $85,000 is a fair market price for national defense information? You know, the number of zeros is all dependent on your perspective. You know, uh, some somebody, everybody has a price in Texas. We, we, we say we all know, you know, we're just negotiating on price now. We, we're all know, we're trying to make a deal. We're just negotiating on price. So um, is it 85000 Is it 8500 Or is it eight? Point five million. It, you know, it, it's irrelevant. It's still uh, trying to breach the data. Yeah, and and we're talking about somebody. If assuming they did get the clearance, like you said, and go through the protocols. Um, I mean, this goes back to the insider threat. How much trust? You know, we have to give ac people access to do their jobs. Obviously, so there's a, always a level of trust built in. Is there anything additional there that can be done to to stop something like this from happening? Well, I thought an interesting red flag, which it's not called out, but to me that he quit within three weeks after getting a clearance like that and starting a job and quit within three weeks, that would have been a huge insider risk red flag, in my opinion. And and maybe that was part of what was used in, in setting this up. Uh, it's hard to say. We don't have enough information. Agreed. So we'll move on to the, the next story. LA school district published a on excuse me LA school data published on leak site the Los Angeles Unified School District confirmed that a ransomware organization began publishing exfiltrated data about its students online the files appeared on the leak site for the Vice Society ransomware organization known for targeting educational organizations sounds like a nice group of individuals the attack occurred over Labor Day weekend with the threat group issuing a ransom demand on September 22nd. The district did not negotiate or pay the ransom in accordance with advice from the FBI. Leaked data includes social security numbers, passport information, and secret and confidential documents, including psychological assessments of students. So what what unique challenges, uh, Patrick, here would a school district face? How would, how would a uh, an organization that we know has sort of limited funding uh, for its IT and security staff, how would they defend themselves against, you know, arguably some pretty sophisticated threat actors here? Yeah, so I'm going to take the same argument that that many school teachers and advocates of school teachers have taken for years that, you know, school teachers aren't, we, we entrust them with educating our youth and yet we don't necessarily pay them uh, an appropriate amount. And I think that's the same with respect to, uh, if you look at cyber or tech, you know, cybersecurity especially is, we, I don't know that we as taxpayers fund, especially public schools like this, sufficiently to be able to afford the kinds of uh, tools and uh, people to, to, to you know, rise to that level of security. Uh, everybody's working on a shoestring, but our shoestring is a whole lot longer than that of public school systems. And I think, uh, you know, we have to give serious consideration to whether there's a funding issue that's allowing uh, them to be more vulnerable. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and and um, I guess you know d- that don't go out and vote no on your on your school budget because they might have some ransomware protection built in there. Read the read the fine print. <laughs> That's that's true. And, and you know, we, we never know. It's, it, it's, it's all speculation, but we also don't know that the budget that they are giving is necessarily going appropriately to some of the security items. You know, maybe maybe there's some opportunity for the budget to be moved around a little bit differently and still give proper education and learning facilities to the kids and, and, and fund this. But when you have teachers that are out there having to fund their own supplies in their own classrooms, I think it's a much more systemic problem than, than, than just, you know, one thing. And again, do you think that this is something where we need government intervention to, to help provide funding, training resources um, to help with the security aspect? Uh, you know, um, again, short of regulating and setting standards, I, I don't know that there's anything else we can do because it's all based in taxpayer dollars. And uh, at least the way everything is generally designed, it's local localities have the the initial set of money with respect to the school districts because they're usually locally run. And then there's a level of state funding and a level, level of federal funding. But um, yeah, somehow that needs to be increased or realigned. Thank you. All right, let's move on to our last story. Fraud hitting P2P payment apps. A new report from the office of Senator Elizabeth Warren found an increasing prevalence of fraud and scams using peer-to-peer payment service Zelle. Zell is co-owned by Bank of America, Truist, Capital One, J.P. Morgan Chase, PNC Bank, U.S. Bank, and Wells Fargo. Since the second half of 2021, data from f- four of these banks shows over 192,000 cases of fraud resulting in over $213 million in losses uh, using Zell. Despite bank ownership, the report found that only 3,500 cases where banks reimbursed for the losses. And on average, they only re- uh, reimbursed 47% of those funds. So um, the question uh, here is, obviously there's a lot of big banks involved. Why is, why so few of these fraud cases being reimbursed back back to people? Uh, you know, aren't there regulations in place to sort of uh, hold the banks accountable and the, and the, the apps accountable for, um, you know, reducing fraud and, and, and paying back customers. Yeah. And, and I guess it, it, it comes for me, it comes down to looking at Zelle is, is a very open kind of uh, uh, app to use. And so there aren't a lot of specific controls on guaranteeing authentication of the uh, target for where you're sending the money. It, it, it will pop up and say, Hey, you're sending it to this person. But there are tons of warnings that say, make absolutely sure you're sending it to the right person, the person that you want to. So I think the banks have kind of relied on the fact that they can, they're they saying, hey, we warned you this is not super secure. You got to be sure and we're out of it. It's not like credit cards where there are other checks. It's not like uh, bank transactions and, and bank direct transactions that there are other checks and balances. This is pretty open. Um, so I'd be curious to know how are these people being scammed out of that? That would be the awareness that would help fix that problem. How do you get scammed into sending that much money that many times? Um, and, and, and and the other interesting thing to me is if you look at those bank names, caught my eye right away. Sean, you're in GRC as well. Um, those are many of the same banks that got together and formed a coalition a couple years ago and bought a small GRC company and now they are uh, trying to force that GRC company onto vendors as their third-party assurance company. So they're trying to build, uh, ultimately build a revenue stream on doing third-party assurance. I got to wonder what's going on with all of that too. <laughs> that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, twist. And and thank you for your thoughts uh, on this and all the stories. The time has gone super quickly. Um, we're already at the end of time. So I will ask of the stories we went through, Patrick, were any uh, particular standout as a, a thumbs up or an eye roller for you? Well, I, again, I, I'm most interested in the, in the Uber story, because again, I think that, that, the hardest thing we deal with is is uh, doing the right thing all the time, even when you're not, even when nobody's going to see you. And so, I, I, I think that's a huge uh, hat hat tip to ethical behavior all the time. 
All right. And where can people find you and the interwebs if they are so inclined or maybe in the phone book? I, I think I'm fortunate enough that they're going to pop up my LinkedIn there, but LinkedIn's probably the easiest way to get me. Uh, and I'm pretty, pretty responsive and pretty open to connecting. So. Awesome. Well, thanks again for your time. Thank you to our guest, Patrick Benoit, VP of Global C GRC, excuse me, and BISO at CBRE. Thanks also to our sponsor, Hunters. Help your SOC mitigate real threats faster and more reliably than SIM. A reminder to join us next week for Super Cyber Friday. Our topic of discussion will be hacking data protection, an hour of critical thinking about what works best to protect, track, and know who is trying to access your critical information. That will be followed by the Week in Review show. And in the meantime, you can still get caught up on your daily cyber news fix through cybersecurity headlines every day in about six minutes. Until next week, I'm Sean Kelly. And for Rich Straffolino, who would want me to wish you all a very sparkly day. Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOSeries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.